Welcome. Hello and welcome to 417 Magazine's Life Interrupted series presented by Burrell Behavioral Health. I know it's right at 11, so we still have some more people getting uh, logged on. So um, we'll go ahead and get started with introductions. I'm Logan Aguirre, President and Associate Publisher at 417 Magazine. On Tuesday, if you were able to join us, we spoke with Dana and Christina Ford about how COVID-19 has impacted their marriage and their home life. A quote from Dana that I loved is, we're all in the same boat, but it's a different storm for everyone. For some, it's a sprinkle, and for others, it's a hurricane. And I think that is really so true. Today, we're kicking off our second segment of this four-part series, and we're talking to two local families about major life moments that have been interrupted by COVID-19. Each family has really amazing and vulnerable stories to share on how their lives have been impacted by the coronavirus. So we have a huge thank you to Steve Cox and to the Elmquist family who have been, um, they've actually known each other for years and, um, but have two different stories to share with us today. With May being Mental Health Awareness Month, we asked Burrell Behavioral Health to team up with us to how, discuss how to navigate this new normal. Burrell is the second largest mental health system in Missouri with more than 45,000 clients across 25 area counties. Their team members work to form meaningful connections and create individualized care plans while collaborating with family, schools, and healthcare systems to provide the appropriate care for each situation. We're so appreciative of them and all they do for our region. With us today, as she was on Tuesday, is Dr. Shelley Farnan. If you missed our first webinar, Dr. Farnan is a licensed psychologist who serves as Burrell's System Director of Diversity and Inclusion and spearheads its daily Be Well initiative that has been leading communities through self-care and connection during this time. Dr. Farnan, we're really glad to have you here with us today as the expert on mental health. I wanna say as um, you're joining us today, if you have questions of your own that we aren't covering, please um, feel free to submit those in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. If you send your questions to all panelists, then we'll all get to see them and um, when appropriate, we can make those part of the conversation. Dr. Farnan, we know that all of our Life Interrupted panelists are grieving in one way or another and that the grieving process looks a lot different for everyone. Can you kind of set the table for us today before our talk about the grieving process? Absolutely. And Logan, you have, have, have already helped us set the foundation. We are all grieving. So we're going to uh, hear very unique experiences today. Uh, but that collective grief, I was actually going to talk about that second, but you already, you already named it and I love that. So we are all experiencing collective grief for the life that we lived prior to COVID-19. And that encompasses a lot, loss of physical touch, loss of uh, routine and schedule, maybe loss of job, loss of family, loss of stability and um, loss of experiences and uh, f uh, like cross today, loss of things that we've been working towards for so many years and looking forward to for so many years. So, so that collective grief is critical for us to, to pay attention to and be aware of now. So thank you for going ahead and just setting that foundation. The thing about grief is, is that there is no one right way to grieve. There is no roadmap, unfortunately. It's going to look different and unique for all of us because we are all unique humans. There is no uh, start point. There is no end point. But what we do have are some general stages. So all of this today is going to be rooted in Elizabeth Kubler rosses work as well as David Kessler who has just recently actually added a sixth stage to grieving. But what really matters for us as a human grieving, we don't care about what those stages are. I'm going to share those with us. But what we matter is, what matters to us is that we miss whatever it is that we've lost. That's what grief is, right? We've lost people. We've lost livelihoods. We've lost normalcy. So, so that is the key that I want all of us to take away from today. Even though I'm going to share the stages and I provided you the resources to go to later, our grief is the most important um, and the most meaningful and impactful to all of us. And I'll say that again here in just a little bit. But the stages of grief start with denial, anger, then we bargain, 
uh, we experience sadness and depression. We move into this acceptance space and that's where David Kessler has really built in this um, finding meaning in the loss and, and in the grief. And that doesn't mean like, oh, um, this happened for a reason. This is because I, I was a, a bad Christian or a bad human for that matter. Grief and loss just happen in life. And so we find meaning in the things that we've lost. So David Kessler lost a child. And so while he's not celebrating the loss of that child, uh, the meaning for him is that he was able to meet his child in this lifetime and that he was the he was the one that was able to be the parent to his really cool child right so so there's this additional step beyond acceptance and, and again there's no end to grieving we don't get to acceptance and we just say oh, okay we're done loving the person that we've lost or we're done loving that that life that we lived before COVID we um, our love and connection with those that we have lost continues on and on and on. And so then we find meaning in ways to celebrate those losses throughout life and find meaning. And I think the only other thing that I had wanted to say with that is, is that collective grief piece that we started off with today. There is no way around grief. We have to feel it to heal from it. And so, so it's messy. And, and so I want to say that too. It's going to be messy. We need it to be messy because we need to feel it so we can heal, heal and then find meaning in, in that grief and loss. So I think that's, that's all I have for setting the foundation for the conversation today. And I can almost guarantee you that our families can, can say this way better than I can. Oh, well, <laughs> Shelly, thank you. Um, I really appreciate you, you know, um, addressing just that there's no beginning and there's no end. And it looks a little bit different for everybody. No one ever is grieving the same way as somebody else, even if they're sharing the same loss. So it is a very complex emotion and um, process to work through. And we um, really appreciate the families today sharing completely different ways in which um, they're grieving things that have been taken away. So uh, first we have the Elmquist family. Can you guys say hello? Hi. How's everybody? Uh, hello. And, um, and also the Cox family. So, or sorry, just Steve. Steve, can you say hello so you can pop up? Hello. Hi. Um, Steve, we're going to start with you. You are uh, born and raised 417 Lander, and if you're a Springfield sports fan, then you know Steve for his legendary basketball skills during his time at Jury. Legend. They're legendary, huh? You didn't tell me yeah. that. Well, the, the older I get, the bigger the legend has gotten. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the entrepreneur turned realtor has been married to his beautiful wife, Lisa, for 30 years. Together, Steve and his wife have two daughters who have successful careers as a designer and a dental hygienist. Look at that beautiful family. That's my son-in-law too, Dylan. He's a uh, pharmacist. So he's out there working hard on these front lines right now. Very no kidding. And just with the uh, two degrees of separation that is 417 land on Monday, your daughter Megan was the dental hygienist for my son Cruz. So um, all kinds of connection points. And she's, yeah. she's really so good at what she does and just a beautiful um, person. I know you're very proud. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm very blessed. And the other connection point is today we're going to talk about your mom and um, and my grandma and your mom shared a table together at Morningside for years. So my grandma has since moved to the Fremont, um, but I got to share quite a few lunches with your mom and um, she was a firecracker. Not that I have to tell you that, but uh, <laughs> can you just tell us, <laughs> there she is. Yep. Oh my gosh. Yeah, <clears throat> that's Corrine. There um, she is. I took a similar picture of her and one of her friends um, when they were they dropped by my body shop to say hi, um, and it was they were both had you know these big beaming smiles on in this little bitty car, and I I <laughs> sent it out. I said, "Here's Thelma and Louise." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She um she and she and my great aunt, great, great aunt Clastel were thick as thieves for years. So, um, yeah, I, I just can't believe that, um, uh, connection that we have through them. Yeah. You're, you seem way too young to, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that, but I'm glad I'm pulling that off for you. Um, older ladies in your family that uh, were so close to, to my mom and my family. It's, it's really amazing. Yeah. 
So can you just um, share a little bit about the story about COVID-19 and how, um, you know, it took the life of your mom at 97? Yeah, um, she has lived in an assisted living environment for uh, eight years and had really relatively great health. Um, you know, she, she had a fall or two, which uh, is kind of expected when you get up in your 80s and your 90s, but she was always able to, to bounce back. Um, <clears throat> but that's what landed her actually in, in an assisted living environment. Um, and, uh, you know, she, at the beginning of March, um, I, th I think the last time, the last time we were all together, we took her to dinner on March 4th and everybody was happy and healthy. Um, and then a week or so later, she started to get kind of a low grade fever. Um, the people at the assisted living home were watching after her. She really didn't have any, you know, lung symptoms or anything else, you know, alarming. And this was all at the time where we didn't know what we were all headed for with, with COVID. Um, thought it was the flu or a cold or something like that. And then, um, <clears throat> on the 17th, which was St. Patrick's Day, um, it was decided that she needed to go to the hospital. And again, that's when COVID was ramping up and, you know, the whole community, world community was like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? So I said, let me run over and grab her and I'll take her to the hospital. And they, that's when it really hit me the hard, uh, hardest, the first was when they said, you can't you can't come over here and get her. She has to go by ambulance. So, um, you know, off she went to the hospital. That was the 17th and she was just very weak. And uh, we talked on the phone often uh, those next several days, but by the 23rd, um, it was pretty much decided that she wasn't going to make her way out of it. And the doctors were, you know, great. They were real forthcoming with us throughout the whole process, but you know, they explained this is what's gonna happen to a 97 year old woman and this is how she's eventually gonna go. And once they moved her to what they called uh, comfort care, um, it only took about six hours for her to pass away. So that was the 23rd of March. And, and no one in your family could be with her. <clears throat> no, and that's, that's, you know, the heart-wrenching part for not only our family, but for families all over the, the world is that if you dwell on that thought that, you know, we can't be there, we want to be by her side, we want to be holding her hand, she's lonely, she's afraid, she's scared, you know, if you, if you let yourself get wrapped up in that, which is natural, but... Um, that's where you know our family has had the, obviously the hardest part dealing with it however we had an amazing nurse um all the staff at cox were were amazing and one little nurse in particular whose name is Alyssa, she was um always there when we called she was able to get the phone to my mom she uh you know, you could tell her level of care and caring was so high. And when mom passed, she was the one to call us to let us know. And she said, I want you to know I was right here with her um, that whole day, actually. She was my only patient. And uh, I was with her when she passed and there was music in the room. And so she just set this scenario for us that we could live with, you know. We just pictured this beautiful young nurse who I was able to actually go visit the next day. And I couldn't hug her, obviously, but um, we had a great interaction and we let her know how thankful we were. Yes, um, I, I know the healthcare workers right now are the heroes. And um, a lot of times, you know, they are the ones that are um, helping through the entire process, including yeah. the, and. Um, you know, Shelly, is there any anything you would want to frame here as far as, you know, those, you know, just not getting to do the 
the things that you would normally feel like you could be there for in something this hard. Yeah, and Steve, just thank you for for sharing your your mom with us and your your healing with us. Um, it's a hard thing to do, and and you're and you're doing it. Uh, I knew you'd be better at this than I was, Steve. <laughs> um, and so it, exactly um, what what you all are saying, and and Steve, kind of st- there are spots that we get stuck in grief, and what Steve is talking about is the hardest one of what if we would have done this differently, or we get focused on right now we can't be with our our loved ones, we can't um, grieve together the way that we usually do, and then we have all of these traditions that come along with with our significant losses. That's the way that we celebrate our loved ones' lives, and that all feels on. Hold. So what our brains are having to do and what families are having to do and, and what Steve is doing. So I'm not just talking about like folks out there. What I'm saying is we're all having to find these new ways to grieve. And again, there is no map for that. And used to, we had kind of a tradition that we could at least follow. We could rely on that. And now we are just creating it on the fly to make meaning and, um, and to celebrate the, the lives of the folks that we love so dearly. Do you guys have plans for, um, I mean, because you, you can't, you couldn't have any uh, normal funeral or visitation process. And is that something you guys plan to do later? Or were you able to get together in any way? Well, interestingly enough, <clears throat> she, she had wanted to be cremated and she didn't want a big service. And um, so uh, her, uh, I had a brother that was killed back in 74, who was 18. And then my dad passed away about 30 years ago. So they're buried at East Long. And um, we are actually tomorrow going to bury her remains. We're gonna have just a family, uh, you know, graveside service. And there'll be probably 10 or 12 of us there. Uh, Luckily, our closest family is all here, here. Uh, in Springfield. So we're actually going to finally get that uh, done tomorrow. Uh, And then a month or two down the line, whenever we'll have more of a celebration of life for her because she has nieces and grandkids, um, you know, all over the region and all over the country that'll, that'll want to be a part of that. But it's going to be great tomorrow to get this part of it actually, you know, done. Yeah. A little bit of closure just on the holding pattern that you guys have been in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's affected all of us differently. You know, the, the adults in our family, we understand it. Like the doctor said, we understand it in a different way than my nieces and nephews, her grandkids, you know, we're, we, we all look at it, you know, in the same way, but get there from different paths. So. Mm -hmm. It's the grieving has been complicated. I'll put it that way. Yeah. It, it, and one, one final thing, something that has really stood out to me and kind of just, um, even before knowing this conversation was going to, to be possible, I was needing to, to really dig into grief work just based on what we were living through. And one of the coolest things that has stood out to me is that, you know, we learn to love people in life and that doesn't end when, we, when they leave this earth. That relationship continues. Historically, I think we felt like, okay, now that relationship is over and we have to say goodbye and it's all said and done, but it doesn't. What I just heard from Steve and his family is that their um, Miss Kareen is living on within the family like that relationship lives on within the family and within each of us and for me and maybe that's just me trying to make meaning in it but uh, the relationship doesn't end we just learn to love our loved ones um, after they've left the earth we just we learn a new way to love folks Steve can you share the story about the last time um, when you stopped by and delivered the oh (laughs) (laughs) well she was convinced, um, and this was after they'd been locked down at her uh, facility, you know, there were no, no ins, no outs. Um, the residents all had to stay in the rooms, but she had a, a little side patio door and um, she and I would bicker quite a bit about stuff lovingly and jokingly and we'd kind of amplify it. And she had made a comment about, um, she had heard that they weren't making mentholatum anymore, um, the deep heating rub. And 
uh, and she really liked to put that on her, you know, upper lip, I guess, at night. It just kind of soothed her. It's very, you know, obviously menthol <laughs> soothing. And uh, I said, Mom, that's crazy. They're, they're still making menthol egg them. And, it, you know, we just kind of went back and forth about that. And a few days later, I was in the grocery store and I saw this big thing of menthol egg them. And I thought, I'll show her. So I, I bought it and I went to her facility and just knocked on her back door. And, you know, I'm sure it scared the heck out of her, but she peeked out and I held up that little jar and she cracked the door open and I handed it to her and she shut the door. And then we both just laughed at each other, you know, through the glass. So, cool. um, but, you know, that's silly, but that's the last time I, I saw her. And, you know, we got a little chuckle, so yeah. that was worth it. Yeah, but um, I thank you for sharing that story. I know um, <laughs> it just, it really il illustrates the relationship you guys had. It illustrates uh, the spirit that she had. And, um, you know, moments like that are what, kind of to Shelly's point, you know, when you just reflect on um, what the lessons are and the, you know, the meaning behind her life and, that you know you have those moments to hold on to right so thank you so much for sharing um now i want to um you do now just briefly we'll touch on in in addition to all this you one of your best friends was also in the hospital with COVID 19 on the same floor as your mom yeah um so you know some of us don't know anyone with COVID 19 and you now have had it you know hit someone um that's a friend of yours and your mom. So, um, you know, how is Mike doing and what's his kind of grieving and healing process look like? How have you been able to help him a little bit through that? Well, Mike Manzardo um, is who we're talking about. And he's my age, 55 years old, and he's the best man of my wedding. And we've known each other since kindergarten, I think, literally. Um, <clears throat> and he's a big, strong you know, active guy. And for this to hit him as hard as it did, you know, uh, was just a shock to, to everyone. I mean, that's one of the, he's one of the outliers, I guess, that, you know, some, some people obviously get it, they have it, they don't even know they have it, uh, it's gone and, you know, or they have flu-like symptoms or something like that. Well, this knocked him out um, so hard, he was, hospitalized 25 days he was just like some of the people that you see on the today show or whatever they uh, he was intubated uh, the ventilator was breathing for him um, it just seemed to get more and more serious um, as the days went by and it got really scary about halfway through his intubation period when they tried to take the ventilator out, take him off the ventilator and um, realize real quickly that it wasn't gonna happen that day. They had to re-intubate him. And then he started spiking fevers and you know, we as a group of friends and just family and strangers, everyone was praying so hard for, for him. You know, it's one thing to anticipate the grief you would feel when you're 97 year old mother might pass away. And it's another to anticipate the grief of losing a, a friend, you know, in his fifties with a family and college age son and daughter in the, in her twenties. And, you know, just how devastating that would be um, to grieve him. Um, so people put out prayer requests all over the world, basically for him and, um, just a real concerted effort to lift him up and pray for those doctors. And he, uh, he made it out and he's been, I, gosh, I don't know. He's probably been home two weeks now, but, um, he's getting stronger every day. Um, he takes walks and some of us friends will go over and walk with him. You know, it's, and it, we're talking eight minutes or 10 minutes or 13 minutes. I mean, these little, incremental milestones that he reaches as, as he gets better. Um, he lost 32 pounds or something like that. And, uh, you know, he's just slowly gaining his strength and his weight back. But I tell you, that, that hit 
me and his amazing family and uh, all of our friends, you know, so hard, this parallel, them both being in the hospital at the same time, he on one end of the spectrum and my mom on the other. So, uh, but he's doing great and uh, better all the time. And we just couldn't be more thankful for that. Wow. That's um, so much for one person like you to have happening at the exact same time. And, um, you know, and, and seeing two different outcomes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Dr. Farnan, we know that we, we talk a lot about flattening the COVID curve, but we're also talking about trying to flatten the COVID-19 mental health crisis curve. That's just so, you know, a direct response from, you know, the intensity surrounding us. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how, you know, especially if you're in isolation or isolated from getting to see your loved ones while you're going through this type of thing, you know, how that's further complicated things. Yeah, and just listen to, and I think as we just, even just, I, I had a thought to, to kind of walk through many of us and things that we're experiencing, but we could just um, allow Steve's story to kind of lead us there. Like we're saying, that's a lot for any of us. And uh, I think Adam Andreasen said uh, several weeks ago that, that uh, these are just human issues that we're living with. It's not like a mental health uh, diagnosis. And some of us do have mental health diagnoses and we had a, a mental health crisis before COVID-19. So if we think about suicide being on the rise, the, the amount of us who are experiencing depression and anxiety and not receiving care or not able to receive care. So that was going on before COVID-19. Then hear Steve Cox's story and, and listen to your own stories. Make sure that you're naming and sharing your own stories. We, none of us are immune from mental health impacts right now. We are seeing that um, more than half of our nation are experiencing negative effects of, through COVID-19, which is really scary. I mean, um, uh, to think through the, the economic decline and the systems that are not available at this point are not able to sustain to, to care for us. Um, but I want to get back to what Steve just said, like we are all in this together and we are at this point our best resources. Us being on this call together today is healing for many of us that it's not to the level of, of seeking uh, professional mental health help. And this is healing, folks. So what we are getting to do today, and Steve, as you mentioned, friends and strangers across the nation coming together, that's healing. And that's not what I plan to talk about right now. But um, so we think about so we, we think about the crisis that was happening before with mental health. We think of the stigma and the shame and the, the secrecy that we that goes along with mental health concerns and mental health diagnoses. And then we think through all that we've lost, the drastic changes that we've gone through. We went from balancing work you know, like work-life balance to now becoming a stay-at-home employee, a stay-at-home parent, um, and on and on and on, and also homeschooling and, and navigating the grief and loss of all of our children, being a therapist. So all of that is taking it. We're not immune, right? We are, none of us are immune here. And then we also want to start talking about, um, and I, we have been talking about, our healthcare heroes. So we are trained as healthcare professionals to serve, and that's what we do. And we have a really, through that training, we're able to kind of compartmentalize all of the emotion that our bodies and brains are feeling so we can serve. If we, if we take one moment to really think about how we're feeling in those scary moments, then we're going to slip up and we're not going to be able to save the lives. And right now with COVID, we're finding that we're not able, whatever we've been trained to do isn't saving lives anyways. So all of that to say our healthcare heroes need us now more than ever. Um, it's going to be unexpected. It's going to be a wave of just like feeling as though we hit a wall and that's when we need support. And we're not going to be able to reach out for support. We have to just take support to people right now, like we're doing, like these conversations, making sure that we are looking out for one another. Uh, community is our most protective factor right now. And that means any relationship, our families, our friends, and and complete strangers that you know uh, could use some support right now. I'm hopeful that that, that, that helps um, just kind of set that foundation of we have a lot of work to do to flatten that second curve and in conversations like this, I again, I just feel thankful that 417 is allowing this conversa conversation because for so many years we've been really scared and uncomfortable to talk about mental health and wellness that we all have. Thank you, Jelly, and really yes. thank you so much, Steve, for um, being so vulnerable and willing to share. I, I know that your story is helping others. 
Um, we're going to switch gears and talk to the Elmquist family now and um, how they've had moments interrupted in a completely different way and one that a lot of us can relate to. Um, so we have Cresha and Cross and Kirk with us today. Kirk and Cresha have been married for 26 years. Um, Cross is their son who's 18 years old. He's wrapping up his senior year at Kickapoo online right now. And um, they also have a daughter, Chloe, who is a student at Missouri State. So um, from sports to graduation to prom, um, lots of big life moments that we um, you work really hard for. And as parents, you um, have the, you know, anticipating the excitement of getting to see your kids go through those big milestones. Um, just being postponed or completely stripped. And, um, and so there's a lot of emotions for Cross, but also um, for the parents of kids who um, are having these types of things, these moments being interrupted. So Cross, tell us a little bit about the very abrupt end to your uh, basketball career at Kickapoo and um, the last shot you took, not even knowing it was gonna be the last one. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, not knowing that you can't make it to the Final Four and not being able to play for your, your title that you were working for the, your whole season. Um, that was that was weird for sure and knowing I missed my last shot and it's just it's tough mm. knowing that you can't you can't get that back and not playing in college it's like it's just gonna be not as competitive in college if I'm playing like a like a rec game or you know intramural or whatever but it's it's just I'm gonna miss that competition for sure um, and not and this isn't and to any certain extent that Steve's gone through right now, but it you know it's still it's still high school and that you miss. But well, you know when she was talking about the stages of grief, and I was thinking about the <clears throat> you know the anger stage. I imagine that there was um, some of that for you and your teammates. Just I mean you you can't you understand, but you're there has to be some anger involved in like, I, this is so unfair. I can't believe this is happening. Yeah. Uh, Coach McHenry called us in. Let's see, that would have probably been two days after our elite eight win. And he, he basically said, he's like, I have no words right now. And I don't, I don't know what to do and what to tell you guys, but we can't play and we're done and our season's over. And, you know, you, you just came off a win. You're like, all right, you know, like, let's go. We were, we were ready to go practice. And he, you know, we're done. He's, he's giving us hugs and he's like, this is it <laughs> basically. So, and that was before we didn't know that um, school was done the rest of the year. And it just, I mean, like so much was just coming in waves. So. Uh, Kirk and Cresha, what, what was it like for you guys knowing that that was all getting just shut down? Well, I am a graduate of Kickapoo also, and um, Chloe just graduated three years ago. And just me as a mother, knowing what Cross was missing out on um, has made it really sad for me because um, as much as he's seen Chloe go through it, or we've talked about what senior year would be like, and especially this last quarter, he hasn't been through it, so he doesn't for sure know what he was missing out on. But I feel like I have a, a really good idea of, of what he's missing out on. And so I have kind of seen it from that perspective. It's been really sad for me, mm -hmm. for him. Yeah. My biggest, um, seeing your kid work his tail off, and like Cross said, you know, the Cox family went through way more than what we're dealing with. But he busts his tail from the time he's a little kid shooting down the driveway. And now he gets a chance to get the ring. Mm -hmm. And uh, he grew up in a unique environment anyway. He was born under the 9-11, went through the stock crashes, went through the challenges of the real estate industry, uh, went through job changes with me. Um, and now this, it's kind of like <clears throat> this generation of this class of 2020, you know, they're built for big things. And to see my kid, cry because he can't compete on something he loves you just got to be a big dad and have big shoulders and suck it up and uh try to hold him help him and listen I think listening was 
a big thing. I've been very involved with the Booster Club and helping them raise money and getting them fun uniforms and making an experience. You know, I haven't shut my yearbook. You know, I love athletics. I love high school. I loved high school. I mean, I love competing and the fun and the friendship. And now that goes away. And then the kids can't come over to our house and hang out and, and have a safe environment where there's no drinking or no drugs going on. You know, we got a good clean environment and they're scared to death to do that in front of me anyway. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like we missed out on a bunch of our friends and Cross's friends coming to be a part of uh, these past 90 days, you know, and two months ago, uh, this Monday is when they heard. So it's just been uh, tough. And, but I think I was trained up a little bit in October. I lost my job. And then I lost one of my dear friends and spoke at his funeral in November. And, you know, it, it, it trained me up uh, to what my kid was going to go through. You know, thank you for sharing and for, you know, talking about how hard it is for parents. I mean, when you're watching your kids, it doesn't matter what sport, it doesn't matter if it's at the YMCA or the elite eight, it's the greatest thing that's happening. And, um, that's right. you know, it's, there's really no more, no joy better than watching your kid do something they love. And like you said, that they've worked so hard for and, and we're in it, you know, it feels very personal. Um, and then in a situation like this where you can't get together with your teammates and at least talk about how hard this is. I mean, there's just that isolation that came right away after um, learning all of this. Dr. Farnan, you know, these big milestones and moments that are interrupted like this, can you talk about how they impact a young adult's mental and emotional health and, you know, coping and grieving from different um, stages of life between, you know, parents and sort of like Kirk has had some things lead up to this that has helped him. But with as kids, you don't necessarily have those things that are training you up. Yeah. And so I've, I've cross and you, you led with, you know, my loss isn't like uh, Steve's loss. Interesting though, comparative grief uh, really doesn't, um, we want to try to steer clear of that because let's go back to something I had mentioned er earlier. The worst loss is our loss. And all of you, um, even, uh, and I'm just going to say mom and dad. So Krisha and Kirk, like mom and dad watching Cross um, experience grief, you have your own parental experience of watching them grieve and then knowing what they've lost. So again, our, uh, the worst loss is always our own loss, and we want to try as much as possible not to compare. And one thing that I know as Steve was listening to you, Cross, we were all, and me, I'll disown it, like I was feeling your loss. I wasn't thinking like, oh, that's just a teenage punk that doesn't know. You know, that's what's, and I said, yeah. yeah. It's real. Yeah. yeah it's real. And it's one of dozens of different categories of loss. And, you know, you don't rank them. They're, they're just, they're all real and they're sickening. Oh, and that connection is what is healing. So Steve, for, for you to say that knowing, uh, cross knowing that Steve lost his mom and, and have, has had other losses throughout life, hearing him say to you like, hey man, your, your loss is real. That's healing. It's a big deal. For, it, it's, um, and we know that. And I think I'm kind of skipping ahead here, but that's what we need to do. Let's use the Elmquist as our leaders. We don't say like, hey, sorry, buddy, we're just trying to stay alive right now. Or you should just be grateful. You, let's, find, let's look at the bright side here bud you can you can play sports sports that aren't that big of a deal that's when we're going to get ourselves in trouble and logan back to your question that's when we're going to see those long lasting mental and emotional health um concerns i, I guess i should say it is natural right now i saw cross start off very um kind of smiling and trying to smile through it but darn it. And I almost wanted to curse like, darn it, that hurts. And it's okay that it hurts. And, and when we want to, when we really want to pay attention though, is when someone's not talking about it, not expressing it, not getting angry about it. Not that we're all going to get angry, but we all, we all need to express this. We have to name it to heal from it. And what I'm so thankful um, knowing is that we have so many families uh, out there that are willing to witness and validate our children regardless of age. So if it's a two-year-old, it's going to look very different to an 18-year-old and it all matters and it all hurts. And, and that's what we root in is that we, Kirk, like you said, listen, 
and we don't try to fix it, we can't fix it. This hurts and it hurts all of us. And that's the hardest thing as a parent. We wanna fix it and we wanna protect and, um, and that actually doesn't, doesn't help our kiddos right now. Yeah, I said a I, lot there, Logan, and I think I jumped around, but no, yeah. You know, I appreciate you saying the comparing grief and that, that um, it's, it's hard. You, you always feel like, oh, someone probably has it worse than me and that you shouldn't feel those things. But um, your own grief is very personal and is okay. Um, and so I, I just appreciate you, you know, validating that. Um, and for Cross at this point of his life, this is the biggest, you know, yeah. and for his friends, this is the biggest thing that, that they've had to really try to work through. And I see one of the comments says, you guys are going to be able to overcome anything that life throws at you. Um, that's one of, one of our attendees is saying, and, and that's, Thank you. Um, that's true. You guys are going to, you know, be stronger for it and telling your grandkids about it. And, um, but talk a little bit about, I mean, their, your season, but then prom and graduation and, um, you know, what are, what are you and your friends saying about all that? Yeah, um, prom is July thir uh, 31st, okay. and graduation is August 7th. And so now that we know, like, okay, you know, we got a date, we're fine, like, <laughs> we're getting it, and that's all we, that's all we needed, um, just a little postponed. <laughs> like not not really expecting it to be that late but um tomorrow we're all because tomorrow would be our last day and uh, it's it's gonna be fun ah. oh man so do you guys um have like a way to get together or meet up in the park? Like, is there any kind of... Can yeah. you tell it? <laughs> yeah. um, can you do it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're meeting up at the parking lot tomorrow and we're all going to our spots that we parked in all year and we're going to like, it's kind of like a tailgate party. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it'll be music and it'll be like the, uh, we'll go up to like the time for the last bell. Uh. What time should I be there, Cross? Cox, <laughs> <laughs> so you tailgate with me, brother. All right. Um, <laughs> Cross, thank you for, you know, just really sharing your heart. And, um, you know, we all remember what it was like to graduate high school and how, um, you know, what a rite of passage that is and a celebration with your friends. And, you know, you know that you're going to get to do it. It's nice to have that date out there, but um, I think it's also really good that you guys are, you know, have a way to have a moment for it tomorrow, even though it's not how you envisioned it. Um, Shelly, do you have anything that you would add in there? I'm just so proud of Cross for not, um, Cross, uh, yeah, and I, I think the audience here today is seeing it too, like you are going to lead all of us to grieve in healthier ways. For so long, I think we've been told to um, push that aside, uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, whatever the sayings are, and we can't do that. That is not, that's not healing for us. And so even being with you today and yeah, for you letting us witness your grief and being so, uh, so strong in it, that is just phenomenal and it hurts. And, and that's what you've, um, you've helped us see today and there is no, there's no amount of fixing it that we can do. So I just want to say thank you. And I, and I kind of want to drive by tomorrow. I just want to drive by. <laughs> we'll be fun. For sure. Sure. Uh, one, we're going up at like 150 to 250. Because 250 okay. is our final bell. So there's, there's uh, supposed to be rain tomorrow, but he said that'll make it more fun. So. Yeah. There you right. go. <laughs> yeah. One Cross, I feel like with that attitude, you're going to be just fine in life. Um, <laughs> so that's amazing. We had a neat victory yesterday, which I thought was, he came home, he got his cap and gown, his yearbook, and his last things, and they all, they had a sign made for every senior to put in their front yard. Oh. So there's some neat little steps to, of uh, some closure mm -hmm. and going through the yearbook and reliving the football season, reliving a little bit of the basketball photos that they were able to grab. And Mm -hmm. You know, those are things that parents say, oh, I don't need to buy a yearbook or you don't need your cap and gown. Yes, you do. There's finalization in life and there's achievement. You're supposed to celebrate victories. And I don't care who you are. Graduate from high school. It's critical. 
because it starts you and he's going to do it. Yeah. 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 Um, we did, we have a great question from Krista Adams and um, it definitely, I, I feel like I really relate to this one because I have younger kids and they're grieving the loss of things too. Uh, my daughter's a fifth grader and she's not going back to her school. The sc middle school she's going to is not the same one as her friends. And so, you know, she's grieving that. Um, she was supposed to be in Matilda at Little Theater. That got shut down. Um, Krista says her kids were really looking forward to Boy Scout camp and Girl Scout camp and, um, you know, activities that they've worked hard for and looked forward to. And so when you're littler and you're trying to help your kids through that and explain um, and, and help them cope, you know, are there different things or ways to talk to little kids about things that have been moments that have been interrupted for them? Absolutely. And that's an awesome question. What we do isn't going to be different. So we want to validate, we want to let them. And, and again, I think the hardest thing for us as parents is to hop in and fix it and say, oh, and try to, we try to cover up our sadness and we try to say, it's going to be okay. We'll do something even better. That's not the healthiest. We need to model. And of course, we're not going to break down boo-hooing and like can't function and, and talk with our kiddo. Um, maybe we do for a moment. But we... Um, that is not, I think that came out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what? after we break down, then what yes. do we do? <laughs> That's absolutely Thanks, not what I <laughs> Okay, so we want to emote in healthy ways to show, um, we want to model for our kids exactly what Kirk and Kreisha are doing, that this is hard. And we don't want to fake it. We don't want to hop in and try to fix it. It's just going to sound different for our littles. Um, one thing that we found a ton of meaning in, and I see Karen Shipley on the line, there are a couple of really neat stories. The little gnome that had to stay home and the great pause. These are some really cool stories that help us navigate with our kiddos mm -hmm. kind of what's going on in the world. And while some of us may be way past that point, some of us may still be looking for ways mm -hmm. to talk to our young, young kiddos about what it is that's going on. What and was so you the find, second book? You said Little Gnome, and what was the second one? The Little Gnome That Had to Stay Home, and the second one is The Great Pause. And those are both by Waldorf um, Institute or Waldorf something. Karen might hop in and, and share that in the chat, too. But we found those very meaningful in my own home. I know in Karen's home and our staff as well has really appreciated those stories with our littles. Mm -hmm. And then there's also this piece of creativity. So after we normalize, we validate and we witness. So you have to name it. And this is the same across the lifespan. You need to, we need to name it. We need to let our kiddos name it. We need to be there to witness it and not fix it. And then we kind of, um, at that point, when we know that our kiddos have felt heard and that parents understand, we move into, um, creativity. How can we, how can the kiddo help us bring those things to life in a new and different way? Never saying that that would take the place of camp, any of our camps, but how could we celebrate in a new way this year uh, until we can return to those activities? Yeah, which is, you know, I guess, you know, what Cross and his um, friends are doing tomorrow. I yeah. know definitely the first reaction is like, okay, so how can I make something magical happen um, that makes it feel like it's all okay, but you know, it's okay. I like that you're saying, you know, that might be your first reaction, but that's not necessarily going to be realistic. Um, you want to, you know, try to figure out how to replace the experiences that are being lost, but it, it's hard to promise those things right now. Yes. Um, so Cross, how have you been staying connected with your friends? And, um, you know, you guys are used to seeing each other a lot and they're always over at your house. And how, how have you guys been able to still stay connected? Um, we have, I've been FaceTiming a lot of them during like quarantine. And then I've been kind of uh, staying close to Snapchat and like texting them a lot. And then uh, just last night I had a couple buddies over and we all hung out. Um, just kind of old times, basically. Um, but yeah, we play a lot of a lot of Xbox together, <laughs> and so that we got them live, and so like we get to talk to each other, and then whether it's like Call of Duty or NBA or Madden or whatever it is, um, we all like we can all get to play together, and that's pretty cool. But um, may, it's mainly like just FaceTime and Snapchat just during quarantine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So it's nice that you guys can still um, stay connected in that way. For some of us with littler kids who they're not on those platforms, um, it's it's a little bit harder for them to feel connected to their friends. So, um, you know, trying to still have, you know, help them have some kind of emotional connection with the, their peers um, has been a little has looked a little bit different because that's that's not how they're used to communicating. Um, can you talk, Dr. Farnan, a little bit about staying emotionally connected um, right now when we're socially and physically distanced? Yeah, and I just want to remind us that after um, our brains assessing for safety, the next most important thing for our brains to succeed and to, to be resilient is to, to be connected with other people. So first, our brains are survival brains, and we survive best when we are connected with others. When that isolation sets in, that's when we see those elevations in, in symptoms, and um, and it could, could get us into the spaces of a mental health crisis. And so there is the parable of long spoons that David Kessler shares, and it's a it's quick and I just want to share it here because I've heard it today. Uh, what we have right now is community and we have each other and we have connections. So a person is brought into a long dining room. The smells are wonderful. There's amazing food all around, but he looks around and everyone is gaunt and sickly looking and he can't figure that out. He's taken into another room and it's uh, the same festive. Everyone's eating and joyous. They have those same long spoons, but guess what they're doing? They're feeding each other. So in the first room, there's a long spoon and, and no one can get the long spoon to their mouth. In the second room, everyone has that same long spoon, but they're feeding each other. And so that's what I'm, I'm carrying today. We're all going through a time where it feels like we have these long spoons and it's really hard to get it to our mouths. But what I'm seeing is that we are reaching out and connecting with other people and that really helps our brains um, to do the best that we can, even though we're grieving and even though we're, we're struggling through the, the pandemic. Yeah, and I liked how you said on Tuesday, just sometimes saying out loud, we are living through a pandemic. That is an everyday saying for me. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's not normal. <laughs> and and so we couldn't have, we yeah. couldn't have prepared for this except for self-care and connection. And that's what we're, that's what we need to be doing every single day. So, um, you know, earlier you were saying how the very last step of grief is finding meaning. And um, so Steve and Elmquist, I would just love for you guys to share, you know, for Steve, a positive moment that's come from all of this or something that will stay with you um, 10 years from now from the experience and um, everything that you've been through. Well, <clears throat> thanks so much for having me in, in closing and for you know letting me be a part of this and we're here hoping that we're going to help people kind of disseminate the their feelings you know through our stories and that's that's why i'm here and i'm sure that's why the old quests are too and i just hope i hope that this does provide that for for uh your viewers but um i would just say the sense of community um you know, we walk our neighborhood all the time um, and we stop and talk to neighbors at a distance that we never encountered before and, um, you know, strike up great conversations and really feel like we're getting to know people, you know, that we wouldn't have had a chance to or wouldn't have taken the time to before. Um, and I know that the friendships that I already have, I think, are stronger. You know, you, when you about lose something, you sure learn to value it a lot more. And, you know, I see that in myself and my family members and my, my friends. So, you know, you've just got to look for positives like that in, in situations like this or any situation. And that's probably the, the, the positives that I have gotten out of it. So beautifully said. Thank you so much, Steve. <laughs> um, Elmquist family, what about you guys? I know that I have cherished the moments that we have all been together. And as much as I mourn what he's missing, um, I would have not have seen him as often as I have in the last two months, especially this time of year. Um, our family is very close. We have our daughter home from college too. And we have had some of the most memorable family times during this quarantine that we would have never had. So such a blessing 
such blessing. And Cross, you've been able to sleep in, right? So yeah, that's uh, been... a lot. <laughs> yes. This is actually super early for him. So um, <laughs> thank you, Cross, for crack a noon. <laughs> Kirk, is there? I mean, Krisha, that was so beautiful, and I think a lot of us are feeling that way that we're getting this bonus time that we never um, ever would get. Kirk, is there anything else you would add? I fully agree with Coxie, uh, known him 25 years and seen him at church and to not see his mama and see his wonderful family and my beautiful wife who usually puts it all intellectually in a good paragraph for all of us. Uh, watching Cross has been tough, but being around him is, as uh, I've had to be a brother, uh, a buddy. I've had to be a dad. I've had to be a boss, uh, a little bit of a jerk every now and then to lean in on certain things. And, but I've tried to become more of a, a closer dad to him, um, whether it be a friend, dad, or somebody who's given wisdom. And he's, you know, he's unbelievable as a kid. Uh, I couldn't have had a better one. And um, I've become more practical. Uh, I can't stand when lights are left on. I can't stand <laughs> when people leave stuff plugged in. I'm, I'm very frugal at the grocery yeah. store. I don't buy the extra Oreos, and I know I want them. I've really financially mentally got myself in check a little bit to say there's some practicalities that I'm learning through this and then I also have learned to read more and disseminate information instead of just take what people say on the media or what comes out of uh, all this and that from a medical person or a business person's philosophy and try to learn myself you know I've read more since I've been I don't think I've read this much since I was in college and it's so peaceful for me to listen uh, more and read more and I think that's, there's some practicality that's come out of this for me. I'm, I'm, I'm a go-getter. Everything I do, I act like I'm putting out a fire. So this has really taught me to shut up and listen a little bit more and try to understand because Chris is very educated on this pandemic. Uh, Cross is telling it from an 18-year-old perspective. And then my 21-year-old college kid is a different perspective. So it's been very helpful to me uh, to be more of a practical listener, to don't think you know everything all the time. You know, listen to good sides and uh, be practical for your family. But uh, friendships and family members and um uh my, my foursome here mm -hmm. we're missing one but she's can hear us i think uh, <laughs> hi chloe <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's sweet loves um you know, i told my kids a long time ago y'all better get along because at thanksgiving all these friends that you're struggling with at school aren't going to be there mm -hmm. and when i'm gone that girl sitting across the table your sister is going to be her and her family so the binding of family i think has been a big big thing and um I've just, I've, I've been really grateful. I'm glad I have a job. I'm glad I have my family. I'm glad I have my health. And uh, we take those things for granted. So just can't be more thankful for being on this today with you and didn't anticipate this dump truck load of emotions coming out. And um, I'll forever hold you responsible for that, Doc. And uh, <laughs> Logan as well. But Coxie, you started this. But uh, wow. I think I've healed through this. And I hope some people that are listening and watching because our whole family in Ohio is on. We appreciate you, but um, thank you. There's some good healing that went on here today. Well, good. I'm, I think we all feel that, and I know you guys have helped others. Um, Dr. Farnan, if our audience members want additional support from Burl, can you just talk about the, a few ways that they can access that care? For sure, every day. So if we're talking through prevention, self-care, and connection, so kind of uh, untraditional ways of mental health support, what we've been, what we've done for the past seven weeks is every day, 12:45 to 1:15 on Facebook Live or on Zoom, we're um, we're hosting a Be Well community. It's rooted in the brain science, and we have a heck of a lot of fun, and we all feel um, lighter afterwards. Not better, but it's helpful every day for self-care and connection. We have um, assistance for medical professionals, videos, telephonic support groups. We have a crisis line. So if it does get to that crisis point, we have help there. We have the behavioral crisis center that's now open and an option as well. We have all of this outlined to provide to you all. I don't wanna run through, I'm, numbers are kind of hard. We have the crisis line. We have ways to schedule appointments. So you can call the 761-5000. You can walk into our connection center at the East, uh, 1300 East Bradway Parkway. You can go to our website and all of the information is housed there except for probably the Be Well community. And then for um, folks who are on social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, 
we are, we are trying as best possible to also bring information to life on social media because again, it is our philosophy that yes, folks can absolutely reach out for help and we know right now every single one of us need and deserve support, uh, self-care and connection and we just wanna make that as available as possible. Well, the work you guys do is really appreciated and, um, and all the access points that you guys have um, continued to create is, um, is going to do a, a wealth of good in our community. So thank you so much. Um, thank you again to Steve Cox and to the Elmquist family for sharing today. Um, it's been a really beautiful experience. And um, if you have people that you know wanted to tune in, but this wasn't a good time, we will have the video um, posted on 417mag.com later so people can come back to it. And um, we'll also be meeting again two times next week on Tuesday to talk about Home Interrupted. We have two families that are gonna share from different perspectives based on, uh, we have a family with small children at home and a family with teenagers. And I'm um, just talking through all the different dynamics that have come with the home life being interrupted and kind of the emotional and mental impact of that. And then we'll finish out next Thursday with College Interrupted featuring President Cliff Smart from MSU and um, their student body president, who's an outgoing senior um, on what that has looked like and what it looks like to come back and also um, all the, the emotional and uh, mental impacts of college being interrupted. So we hope you can join us for those. Thank you all again so much for all your time and vulnerability today. Dr. Farnan, thank you for guiding us through it. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Logan. Thank, thank you, Logan. Love you, brother. Love you too.